I'm an ex-alcoholic, drug addict, criminal, hustler, womanizer, fighter, liar, manipulator, player, drug dealer, thief, abuser, hypocrite, and a worldly confused individual. My name is Ben Lively. I'm not who I was before. I'm a born-again child of the Most High God, anointed, chosen, set apart, and called to represent the gospel of Jesus Christ. I teach Christians the truth of God's word. I'm a mouthpiece for the Lord Jesus Christ. I will not compromise, play any games, or waste time with this mission from on high. I know that in and of myself, I am not nothing. I need God for every breath I take and every move I make. I have Christ living in me and I'm burning with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I'm different now and forevermore. This earth is not my home. I know that and I declare it boldly. I'm strong in prayer, praying in power and in the Spirit. I will preach, teach, deliver, evangelize, prophesy, baptize, and build up groups of believers as God allows. He is working through me as I'm surrendered to His service as an instrument of righteousness. And if you know me or get to know me, you'll realize that I take no credit for this, but God gets all the glory. In Christ I live and to heaven I will rise. so much for tuning in and welcome everyone. Hope you're well. I'm your host Ben Lively and you are listening to Shake and Awake episode number 17. I just wanted to thank you for tuning in wherever you are and whatever you're doing right this very moment. And uh, and listen, if you find any value in today's show, please pass the news, uh, pass the podcast name and link to a friend, family member, or colleague that you feel uh, would benefit from the show and become blessed as you are through the words that the Lord shares through these messages. And as always, I promise you another great show. But more than anything, my hope for you today and always is that you have an actual encounter with the Lord. He is always right there with you, even when you think he's not. So let's get ready to invite him in with us right here, right now and allow them to speak directly to your heart and minds. Uh, So here goes. Here is today's topic. Why and how should you witness to others, even if you're scared, afraid, nervous, or shy? The point of today's episode that God's placed on my heart to speak with you on is one of the most important decisions you can make in your lifetime. Everyone that is truly saved and forgiven has been given a gift that millions and millions have either not been offered or have missed or have turned down in their lifetime. And and you have authority, power, and demand to exercise your ability to speak about that gift to anyone you choose and anyone God puts in front of you to speak with. The question is, have you been? The next question for those that haven't is why not? Why not? So the next questions for that is because they're most say that they're because they're too shy, uh, not knowledgeable enough about the Bible and or God yet. They're too new in the faith. They're introverted. They're scared of looking like a fool or a quote unquote Jesus freak. Uh, Feel it's not their job. Feel that it's not their calling. Feel like someone else will do it, but it doesn't need to be them. That they will somehow mess it up that they don't feel comfortable doing so. And for those that don't know how to initiate the conversation to witness to others, welcome to my world. Welcome to the reasons I had just uh, justified in my head for the past 41 years. And if you fall into one or more of the categories I just mentioned, that by the way, I was in all of them, then this podcast today is going to help you get unstuck and headed in the right direction towards helping to water and or harvest that have too few laborers to work. The message today will be a message to show you what the Bible says we are to do, as well as tips, tools, tactics you can use to start leading others to Christ immediately and show how and why to begin immediately. There's literally so many studies, all dismal, uh, and almost all going in the uh, the opposite directions we'd like to see as the body of Christ, show that the more we advance in 
just about everything good and bad, the stats are falling in the way of those that are sharing their faith with others. Therefore, I, I just picked two studies that immediately stood out to me as some added context and quantifiable proof that uh, this message needs to get out and be shared with other Christians. Can you imagine if the uh, disciples following Jesus' death simply stop preaching and evangelizing? Can you can, can you imagine if they didn't risk and lose their lives to build the church the way Jesus taught and challenge them to? One of the Campus Crusade for Christ ministries known as the Jesus Film Project uh, they're a worldwide Christian organization. They did a recent study on evangelism of over uh, 1,600 Christians and found out that when it came to talking to other people about the gospel, fear was far and away the most significant deterrent. People communicated that they were afraid of losing valuable relationships and wanted to avoid the tensions that accompanied these kind of discussions. Others felt entirely ill-equipped. They'd like to share more, but they're scared and they'll you know, end up fielding questions or, or dealing with objections that were too uncomfortable to, to, to navigate. Now, fear is the common thread that weaves together many of the different responses to the surveys. Respondents used words like fear, scared, or afraid to, uh, to describe their feelings about reasons they don't talk about spiritual matters. For example, many responses came in along the lines of, quote unquote, fear of rejection, or quote unquote, I'm afraid I'll come across as pushy, or I'm scared to start an argument. You know, ad additionally, in 93, Barna partnered with Lutheran Hour Ministries to research reasons why people did and did not gauge in intentional outreach. So a lot's changed since that initial study. So 25 years later, they asked follow-up questions to see if talk of faith had become labored in a, a culture that's more digital, secular, and, and contested than ever. You know, the resulting report, it was known as Spiritual Conversations in the Digital Age. You can, you can actually purchase it if you're interested. Uh, in this report, just 10% of Christians in 1993 who had shared about their faith agreed with the statement that converting people to Christianity is the job of the local church as opposed to the job of an individual like themselves. 25 years later, 3 in 10 Christians who have had a conversation about faith say evangelism is a local church's responsibility. as 29%. A nearly threefold increase. You know, this jump could be the result of many factors, including poor ecclesiology, uh, believing the local church, quote unquote, is somehow separate from the people who are a part of it or personal and cultural bar uh, barriers to sharing faith. Yet the most dramatic divergence over time is on the statement, every Christian has a responsibility to share their faith. In 1993, nine out of 10 Christians who had shared their faith agreed that's 89%. Today, 6 out of 10. Just two-thirds say so. That's 64%. That's a 25-point drop. But what seemed to jump it out at me most was that the more advanced we get, the more we replace Jesus. The more comfortable we get, the more complacent we get, the more we assume or expect others to do what we're responsible for as well. Yet, why don't we? So before we get into the word and what Jesus said and his disciples and apostles stated, why don't we compare and contrast what we know and see if it aligns with the Bible and Jesus' commandments or not? Where is the disconnect and why? Most important, how can we change the current stats from not just getting better, but actually turning them into greats? Who gets excited about coming in sixth place out of tenth? Not me. I would expect not you either. So how many of us recommend things to other people? Restaurant choices, great foods, good songs, uh, nice places to visit, awesome deals on Amazon, great discounts at the stores, alternate routes to get to different destinations, and I could go on for hours, maybe days. Question is why? 
Why do we recommend things to others? Why do we talk about what interests us to other people? Why do we ask people questions when we're not forced to, like at work, etc.? Why are we interested in other safety? Why do we try to help people if we feel like they may be in danger? Why do we call and check up on people that we care about or old friends, distant relatives, etc.? Why do we warn people about things we know to be true if we feel it may help them? Why do we buy insurance? Car insurance, home insurance, health insurance, dental insurance, life insurance? Why do we tell people to put their seatbelts on and pay attention to the road? In other words, why do we do anything we're not forced to do? Because oftentimes we feel that we need to. And other times we feel because we have to. And sometimes it's for both reasons. We have to and need to. It's protection. It's safety. It's security. It's caring. It's sharing. It's effective communication. It's socialization. Question is then, why wouldn't we tell or talk to others about Jesus and his gospel? Well, we've already uncovered the fact that fear is the number one contributing factor. Okay, fair enough. Let's look at it from the other person's vantage point. Or shall I say the person's disadvantage point? Let's call the other person the unsaved, the unsaved Christian, the backslidden, the fallen, you know, the ones that need salvation. If someone was about to run the stop sign you'd likely scream out to your friend to stop to avoid getting T-boned. If someone was sick and was in desperate need of uh, some medical attention, you'd offer to drive them or call an ambulance. If someone was breaking into your neighbor's house, you'd call the police and seek help immediately. If something was about to fall on your child, you'd scream, watch out, or push them out of the way. If someone was about to go out for a nice afternoon somewhere and you knew the four, uh, you know the weather forecast would ruin their time, you'd warn them. If someone was about to drive without putting on their seatbelt, you'd remind them. You know, if someone wasn't watching the road but was on their cell phone, you'd immediately interrupt them and remind them to keep their eyes on the road. If someone was paying for a monthly service they weren't getting or didn't need, you'd probably tell them to stop wasting their time and money and add why to that conversation. If someone was about to cross the road and a car was fast approaching, you'd reach out and pull them back or out of the car's way. If someone was about to get on a, a, a plane and you noticed damage to the plane, you'd immediately sound the alarm. You know, if you smelled smoke coming from someone's house, you'd bang on the door to get their attention while calling 911. You know, I'm, I'm guessing the above are true uh, for, for those of you listening, because I generally believe that's what most, most of us would do anyway in any situation, whether we knew that person or not, or whether or not we are saved. It's called being humane. Then why aren't we doing this for something so much more powerful, so much more meaningful, so much more important? What's the answer? What's your answer? Do you have one? Is it fear for you? What about them? What's the ramifications for getting hit by a car? Injury? Death? What's the ramifications of dying before you're saved? Eternal torment in hell? Being judged directly by God for every sin you've ever committed? Tormented day and night without any hope of ever getting out? Eternity of darkness in the absence of God and anything good? with no way to die, but to permanently be tortured for a million years, then another million, then another million, then another million, only to have recurring memories of hearing about Jesus, but never becoming saved. Never being lovely corrected by a friend or family member or anyone that claimed to truly be saved. Reliving every moment you had to repent and truly love God with all your heart and mind and soul and to love your neighbors as yourself. All you would wish for is one second back on earth to cry out to God and ask his forgiveness and accept salvation. Had you done that, you'd be in a different eternal home, living in paradise where time doesn't exist, nor do you ever want it to. It was one decision that would have taken less than three minutes to make, 
and accomplish, and God would have given you your salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ's death on the cross and resurrection on the third day, to repent of your sins and to be born again. Five minutes or less on this God-forbidden planet out of your miserable life, spiritually miserable at the very least, and your entire eternity would have been pure heaven. Our mind, Jesus said, cannot fathom nor comprehend what awaits us in heaven. Now, I'm, I'm pretty creative, and I can conjure up and get very excited on what heaven could be like, but it will be infinitely better than that, times 100 million. Yet that person never heard from you. That person never talked to you or you to them about what God did for you. That person never was given eternity-saving honor of hearing from you for five minutes about your Jesus and his salvation and grace and everlasting love. Why? You were afraid? If you had to watch in horror as hundreds and hundreds of people you could have helped be led to Jesus, be tormented for even five minutes, and watch as they all look at you in sheer horror and hatred and scream out to you, why? Why didn't you tell me about this place? Why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you even say one little thing that would have helped prevent me being like this? How come you never even gave me one word that could have saved me from this hell? Did you hate me this much to see me here for eternity? What did I ever do to you? Was I not worth it to you? I never had the chance. Like I always say, if the shoe doesn't fit, then let's move on. But if it does fit, kick it off. Now that I've gotten your attention, I, I hope, I want to share what God's word says. We also know many people, quote unquote, believe in God and use that to consciously or subconsciously assure ourselves that the other person is, quote unquote, saved and we don't need to tell them about Jesus. Well, even the demons believed. James 2.19 says, You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. So James is showing the difference between mental agreement and a genuine saving faith. It seems people were claiming that because they believe in the God of Moses and they could only recite Deuteronomy 6.4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. They were right with God. Well, James crushes that false hope by comparing that kind of belief to the knowledge held by Satan and his demons. Satan's demons are more aware of God's reality than most people are. Yet the demons are not right with God. The, de the demons believe some things that are true about God. They know he's real. He's powerful, etc., but their theological accuracy cannot be called faith. There's no salvation for the demons, even though they agree to the truth that there is one God. So what's the difference between the demons' belief and the faith required for eternal salvation? Fortunately, James doesn't keep us wondering. The rest of chapter 2 goes on to explain that faith without a godly result is useless. That's James 2.20. The demon's type of faith caused them to fear their ultimate doom. The type of faith that saves us gives us humble comfort, uh, confidence in our uh, salvation and it changes us, producing holy action. We can better understand that faith requires action through an illustration. So imagine standing on the uh, brink of the, the Grand Canyon, okay? A narrow suspension footbridge spans the entire canyon, and it dips in the middle, sways in the wind, and has a few planks missing. Standing with you on the edge is the architect of that bridge. He's world-renowned for his designs, and he holds the plans in his hands. He asks you if you have faith in his bridge and you eagerly reply, yes, I have faith in you. I believe that bridge will hold my weight. But real faith does not remain on the brink of the canyon. That's only hope. Faith is when you step out onto the bridge and begin walking across the chasm. So it is with salvation. 
The demons know more than we do about the awesome power of God. They watch Jesus Christ come to earth, live as a man, and then be crucified. That's Matthew 2, uh, sorry, chapter 20, verse 28. They trembled in horror as the God-man rose from the dead and walked out of the tomb. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, they saw him ascend back into heaven, and they know that Jesus is the Son of God. You can see that in Mark 1, 24. So the demons believe all this to be true, yet their condemnation is sure. James' point is that mere assent to the historical and theological facts about Jesus will not save a person. Okay, Saving faith results in a new creation which produces good works. It's not enough to believe in God or even to believe that the God of the Bible is the one true God. That belief, void of a change of heart, makes one's theology comparable to that of the demons. Unfortunately, many people may not realize that what they call faith is nothing more than the same mental acceptance that the demons possessed. Perhaps they prayed a prayer, got baptized, or went to church, but the direction of their lives never changed. They were never born again. See John chapter 3, verse 3 for more on that. The truth is, we're not saved by belief in a creed. We're saved by trust in a person. And that trust in Jesus will result in a love for God, a love for people, and a striving for holiness in all we do. And that's explained further in 1 Peter 1, 8, 15, and 22 to 23. You also heard that Faith without works is dead, right? But why is faith without works dead? Well, James said, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. That's James chapter two, verse 26. Faith without works is a dead faith because the lack of work reveals an unchanged life or a spiritually dead heart. There are many verses that say that True saving faith will result in a transformed life. That faith is demonstrated by the works we do. How we live reveals what we believe and whether the faith we profess to have, right, is a living faith. James chapter 2, 14 to 26 is sometimes taken out of context in an attempt to create a work works-based uh, system of righteousness. But that's contrary to many other passages of Scripture. James is not saying that our works make us righteous before God, but that real saving faith is demonstrated by good works. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ has a false or dead faith and is not saved. Paul basically said the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 10. James contrasts two different types of faith, true faith that saves and false faith that is dead. You know, many profess to be Christians, but their lives and priorities indicate otherwise. Jesus put it this way, by their fruits you will know them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Just so, every good tree bears good fruit and a rotten tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a rotten tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the ones who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive demons out in your name? Did we not do mighty deeds in your name? Then I will declare to them solemnly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. That's Matthew 7, verses 16 to 23. Notice that the message of Jesus is the same as the message of James. Obedience to God is the mark of true saving faith. Uh, James uses the examples of Abraham and Rahab to illustrate the uh, obedience that accompanies salvation. Simply saying we believe in Jesus does not save us. Nor does religious service. 
What saves us is the Holy Spirit's regeneration of our heart. And that regeneration will inver invariably uh, be seen in a life of faith featuring ongoing obedience to God. So misunderstanding the relationship of faith and works comes from not understanding what the Bible teaches about salvation. There's really only two errors in regards to works and faith. The first, the first error is uh, what they call easy believism, right? The teaching that as long as a person prayed a prayer or said, I believe in Jesus at some point in his life, then he's saved no matter what. So a person who, as a child, uh, raised her hand in a church service is considered saved, even though he or she has never shown any desire to walk with God since and is, in fact, living in blatant sin. This teaching, sometimes called decisional regeneration, is dangerous and is deceptive. The idea that a profession of faith saves a person, even if he or she lives like the devil afterwards, assumes a new category of believer called the carnal Christian, or just as bad, the cultural Christian. This allows various ungodly lifestyles to be excused, a man may be an unrepentant adulterer, liar, or bank robber, but he's he's saved. He's just carnal. Yet as we see in James 2, an empty profession of faith, one that does not result in a life of obedience to Christ, is in reality a dead faith that cannot save. So the other error in regards to works and faith is to attempt to make works part of what justifies us before God. The mixture of works and faith to earn salvation is totally contrary to what scripture teaches. Romans 4, 5 says, To him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. James 2, 26 says, Faith without works is dead. There is no conflict okay, between these two passages. We are justified by grace through faith. And the natural result of faith in the work uh, in the heart is works that all can see. The works that follow salvation do not make us righteous before God. They simply flow from the regenerated heart as naturally as water flows from a spring. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner has the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit poured out on him. That's what it says in Titus 3, 5. Thereby causing him to be born again. Just like it says in John 3, 3. When this happens, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him. So say Ezekiel 36, 26. God removes his sin-hardened heart of stone and fills him with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit then causes the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word. As shown in Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27. Faith without works is dead because it reveals a heart that has not been transformed by God. When we have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, our lives will demonstrate that that new life and our works will be characterized by obedience to God. Unseen faith will become seen by the production of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. That's Galatians 5.22. Christians belong to Christ, the good shepherd. As his sheep, we hear his voice and follow him. That's what it says in John 10.26-30. Faith without works is dead because faith results in a new creation, not a repetition of the same old patterns of sinful behavior. You know, as, as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Faith without works is dead because it comes from a heart that has not been regenerated by God. Empty professions of faith have no power to change lives. Those who pay lip service to faith but don't possess the spirit will hear Christ himself say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Again, Matthew 7, 23. So in leading up to uh, today's conclusion, we see that there are not just those that you and I know are unsaved, like self-proclaimed atheists or believers in false religions like Buddhism, New Age, 
Scientology, Muslim, Catholic, Hinduism, and hundreds of others. It's also those that think they're saved, but truly aren't. Some of you listening may fall into the same category today. That's the entire reason God led me to do this podcast. It wasn't for the atheists or, or those with false religion, although I can only hope that they'll hear my, my these messages and become saved. It was for the lukewarm, the unsaved Christian, the backslidden, was everyone that was like me for the first 41 years of my lifetime. Because if someone like me had it all wrong for 40, four decades and had the experiences of church, Christian school, etc., how many other millions had it wrong as I did? That was just one conviction I was given to create this podcast. It caused this burning desire to get people saved the way I was so appreciative. Super understatement of the century right there, by the way, that God saved me and used someone to help truly lead me to him. Again, I go over this in detail in my first podcast episode, so check it out if you haven't heard it yet. Just as Penn, uh, Gillette of Penn and Teller said in his video that I aired on episode one, how much do you have to hate someone not to proselytize to them? So where do we go and what do we, what do, we do from here? What's God standing on this? Fish where the fish are. We're swimming in the sea of the unsaved every day no matter who we speak with or where we are. Do you not have a story that you can share about how Jesus changed your life? How about starting there? Speaking from experience is always the best place to start. And oftentimes it's the only place to start and finish. People want to hear from those that are like them, not counterfeits. We have enough of them on TV and online these days. Sharing what's, what, you know, what God's done in your life, I found is the best way to show someone proof that God works in mysterious and wonderful ways to help save the lost and to call them unto him. The story of the gospel can naturally follow, but stories sell, as they say, except we're not selling anything. The beautiful and awesome thing about this is you get God and heaven, which is being in God's presence, forever for free. Give everyone you know a chance to get to know him through you. Please don't let fear stand in between you and those you're called to reach out to. These fears disappear when we realize that a person's salvation isn't dependent on upon our performance. You don't have the power or authority to save anyone. That's Jesus' job. Your job is to tell others about him and he'll do the rest. God is at work in everyone's life drawing them to him. Our small conversations are just a part of that process. So you might initiate that final dialogue that God uses to encourage them to trust in Jesus. And still, more often than not, your conversations or conversation will be the one the Holy Spirit uses to soften their heart. Paul addresses this when he tells the Corinthian church, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 to 7. So my final question to you is then this. Matthew 10, 33 states, but whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my father who is in heaven. Well, what do you think happens to them that Jesus denies before his father, uh, father God? Yeah, you're right. Not telling someone a car is about to hit them when you clearly see it. Isn't that denying them the chance to hear the truth and make a decision? My final statement is this. Don't deny God by your conscious decision not to reach out to others and share Jesus with them. He's given you the gift of salvation and eternal life with him. All he asks is that you share this message with others. Fish where the fish are, they're all around you. So before we end today's show, I just want to thank you all again for tuning in. And I hope you were touched by God through today's message and scripture. I'd like to ask you a favor. If you've received any value out of today's show, would you tell at least one person you know? 
Just call them, text them, email them, message them, talk to them. Tell them to give a show a listen. It may just help their uh, walk with, with Christ. Also, I really need your support. If you could just give me a quick rating on the whatever app you use to listen to this podcast, it'll take three to five seconds. I'd love that help and support from you guys, which will allow the Lord and the Holy Spirit to reach even more lives through the broadcast. And if you'd like to get a hold of me, you can reach me uh, and write me a quick note on www.shaken-awake.com forward slash contact. You can also also email me directly at ben at shaken-awake.com or even call or text me directly for any reason. My direct uh, my cell is 407-493-3208. Again, that number is 407 407- 493-3208. I'd love to hear your feedback, your questions, ideas for the show, requests, criticisms, corrections. Listen, if it's important to you, it's important to me. And if you would like to be a guest on the show, please reach out to me. If you've got a life or eternity changing story that you'd like to share, please let me know and I'll schedule you in. We do not hear enough of the truth these days or the positive ways of God and Jesus Christ these days. And this podcast with your help is going to help change that up. I'd love your help uh, with this where you can. So next week, tune in next Sunday evening or whenever you're able as we dive into another important topic, which will be we don't go to church. We are the church. So next week's episode is another powerful and do not miss episode. Thank you all for joining. Until next week, take great care of yourself and each other. And God bless you all. 